Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to take another look at my Dell Precision 690 and see if we can give it a few upgrades to turn it into a decent Windows Vista era gaming PC. Saying that, calling this a few updates is like calling the late Eddie Van Halen an OK guitar player. No, we're going full 5150 here. Strap in. So the first thing we're going to look at is the CPUs. This machine currently has two Intel Xeon 5130 CPUs, each with two cores clocked at 2 GHz. For the time, that would have been an immense amount of power. A single one of these easily edged out a comparable Intel desktop class CPU from the same time period, and it did it with half the power draw and almost half the clock speed of this Intel Pentium D960, according to Passmark at least. When you consider I have not one but two Xeons in this machine, it's fair to say it's already punching above its weight. That's not to say we shouldn't aim for more though. Dell specified that this motherboard will support up to two Intel Xeon X5355 CPUs. These are quad-core processors with double the cache of the 5130s and a significant bump in clock speeds to 2.66 GHz. And I've got two of them. Almost unbelievably, these were the most cost-effective part we'll look at today. They only cost me £13.20 from a China-based e-waste reseller. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. They, they could well be fake or faulty, but they look spot on, so hopefully we're not going to run into any problems. Next comes the RAM. This machine came to me with four 1GB sticks of DDR2 fully buffered ECC memory, which would have been considerable for the time, but we're going to double that up to 8GB via these four 2GB sticks. What? You expecting more? Okay, I'll double down. Let's go for 8 sticks and 16 gigabytes in total. Still not enough? <laughs> Fine, we'll go full bore and fill every memory slot on this thing with 16 sticks of DDR2 ECC RAM. I really do spoil you lot. Next, I'm going to look at storage. You may recall I set up a RAID array using two Western Digital Blue SATA disks in the last video, and it works just fine. The issue is that even the fastest hard disks in RAID 0 are still not going to be as fast as an SSD, so I'm throwing in this 256GB unit from Kingston. I'll retain the RAID array as well for mass storage as I'm hoping to install many more games on this machine, but having the OS and a few selective programs on the SSD should give me faster boot times and a more responsive system overall. Next we're on to some practical upgrades, and first off I'm going to install this Gigabit Ethernet adapter from HP into one of the PCI-X slots. I know I could have used a modern PCI Express equivalent and gotten a similar result, but the PC gods have afforded me a PCI-X slot, so I'm going to use it. This should make a big difference over the 10100 Ethernet card built into the motherboard, which, if I can get this thing to connect to my Steam library, will make a big difference when it comes to downloading games. Another area where I can improve over the features built into the motherboard is with sound. This machine comes with an integrated sound card, and actually even an integrated speaker, and while this is great for basic playback of MP3s or game audio, I wanted something more fitting of a beast of this calibre. Enter the Creative Labs X5 Fatality PCI Sound Card and Media Connection Bay. It's actually a little older than the rest of the machine, having been designed in 2003, but it should still offer much better sound quality than the integrated sound, and it supports EAX 5.0, so games with support for environmental audio extensions should sound as the developers intended. It also has this media bay, which fits into one of the front five and a quarter inch slots. If I'm honest, I could take this or leave it, but I've got plenty of spare bays, so I see no harm in fitting it. Lastly, I've got this three and a half inch media solution, which will fit neatly in the floppy drive bay at the front of the machine. These were all the rage around the time that this machine was built, as more and more people moved away from floppy disks and towards flash media of various standards. Terrible Chinese screen printed fonts aside, 
These are actually really useful, and seeing as it just needs a USB header on the motherboard to connect it to the system, it's a dead easy upgrade to boot. To further improve connectivity on this system, I did also want to include a PCI Express USB 3 card, but it turns out that these all require PCI Express 2 base slots as a minimum in order to work. I looked at several of these, and sure enough, in all cases, when you dig deep enough, you find that it needs a minimum of a PCI Express 2 based slot. Unfortunately, the slots in my machine are the original implementation of PCI Express, so they won't work, which really irks me. So that's all of the new parts laid out for this machine. Time to get on with it. So that all went quite well. The only issue I had was getting all 32GB of memory recognised by the BIOS. You'll recall I had a similar problem when I first picked up this machine, and it turns out it's because the system is really finicky about how these riser boards are populated. You see, underneath on the system board you've got a full array of 8 DDR2 slots, but using these risers expands that to a total of 16 and the four individual riser boards slot into the first four memory slots on the main system board. As it turns out, if you're only partially populating these risers, then you need to do it in a certain order, otherwise the system can't address the memory properly, even though it might see it in the BIOS. And even when you're fully populating it like I am, you need to make sure the RAM is installed in matched pairs, and as it turns out, the 16 DIMMs I'd picked up contained four interlopers with a slightly different part number, and needed to be installed in adjacent slots for all of the memory to be recognised. Now that I've laid them out properly though, we have a full 32GB recognised in the BIOS, and we're ready to look at installing an OS, and this is where I'm spoiled for choice. Because those Xeon processors are 64-bit, I can literally choose any modern operating system, and it should work on this system with no issues. But what would be the point in installing, say, Windows 10 on this machine? I already have Windows 10 on my main machine, and its specs are vastly superior to this one. I could go with something like Ubuntu instead, but again, I already have a machine set up for that for when I want to do something Linux-based, so there's no obvious reason to do that either. Instead, I'm going to go with what Dell didn't install on this machine in the first place, Windows Vista. Now I know a lot of people have terrible memories of Vista, but to be honest, I think a lot of the negative perception is due to people running it on potato PCs when it first released. It's well documented that on lower spec systems, Vista just didn't run well at all, 
But on this beast, with its 8 64-bit cores and 32GB of RAM, we shouldn't have any problems, right? Well, it looks like it's gone on just fine, and after installing the drivers for the 8800 GTX and a full suite of updates, it's all looking good and runs really well, particularly with the Aero interface turned on. Vista also gives us something which I never had access to on this PC previously, DirectX 10. This should mean that not only do we get the added performance uplift from our CPUs and RAM, but we finally unlock the full potential of the NVIDIA 8800 GTX at the heart of this machine. So let's see how it games now. Starting off with Crisis, the game defaults to very high settings at the default resolution of this monitor of 1440x900. The gameplay looks fantastic, though noticeably those frame rates are lower than we experienced on the high settings under XP in the previous video, dropping down to the mid-teens when there's lots of action on screen. I'm guessing this is partly because of the performance hit from using DirectX 10, and partly the additional overhead of running Vista over XP. Still, it's pretty much playable on very high settings, even when the action builds up on the screen, though I suspect that we could improve things significantly by dropping down to, say, medium settings. Yep, much better. Fallout 3 next, and this is a title that performed really poorly under Vista back when it was released. Bethesda had just about got the game working right under XP, and they pretty much gave up trying to get it to run stably on Vista. When it does run though, it's rock solid, and the capital wasteland still looks great. Out in open areas, the frame rate hovers in the 40 to 50 frames per second range, but when the game loads new assets, it can drop significantly for a couple of seconds. On internal areas though, it's more or less stable at the capped 60 frames per second. Batman Arkham Asylum is another game that I demoed in the last video, and just like Crisis, it takes a significant performance hit under Vista. We were getting frame rates of up to 60 frames per second on this opening scene, but under Vista and with DirectX 10, it drops down a lot, and I anticipate in busy fight scenes this would drop even further. Unfortunately, that's pretty much the limit of what I can show you in terms of gameplay. Unfortunately, there are no current workarounds to get Steam to run on Vista, and as many of the games I owned after this period required a Steam account to authenticate with, I just can't get them working. Gaming is only half the story with this machine though. I want to know how well it performs in other types of workload, and to do that, I need to look at some benchmarks. <laughs> no, not that benchmark. God, that thing was awful. First up, let's take a look at Cinebench R15. This returns a result of 479, which chomps at the heels of the Core i7-3840QM, which was one of the higher-end mobile CPUs introduced in later 2012. That's not exactly reassuring, but it does score about four-fifths as high as the Core i7-3770, and that's a desktop-class processor from nearly six years later. It's the equivalent of a KB Lake processor from 2016 competing with a modern Core i7-12700K, which is pretty bonkers. Next is Passmark's Performance Test 9, which is the latest version of their software which will work with Vista. This shows the CPU actually performing quite well, coming in at the 46th percentile of all systems in Passmark's database although I'm not clear if this is only systems that ran this version of Performance Test, or includes machines that ran the newer version as well. Overall, the machine came in at the 37th percentile, with that DDR2 memory dragging the overall performance down. Not bad for a 15-year-old machine. Lastly, I punished the machine with the Heaven benchmark from Unigine, and it actually didn't do too bad of a job running in DirectX 9 mode, returning around 23 frames per second and an overall score of 582. Which sounds pretty reasonable, until I tell you that when I ran the same test on my main gaming PC, it came in at 110 frames per second at 4K and scored 2781 overall. 
That is an extremely unfair comparison, mind you. We're talking about a machine that's 15 years old versus one that I built 18 months ago, and as of recording this, is still a very high-end machine. So overall, what's the verdict? Well, as ludicrous as these upgrades would have been back in 2007, what I've kind of done in 2022 is ruin a perfectly good Windows XP gaming PC. Don't get me wrong, the overall impact of those upgrades is clearly evidenced in the past mark benchmarks, but have I added any value in terms of gaming performance by increasing the number of CPU cores and going from 4 gigs of dual channel RAM to 32 gigs of quad channel? Well, no, not at all really. In fact, I've impacted performance by upgrading to Windows Vista, meaning that a number of XP games simply won't work, and those that do and support DirectX 10 have taken a significant performance hit compared to what I had under Windows XP. Still, I'm not done messing around with this thing. Next up in completely ridiculous computing world, we'll be upgrading this thing to Windows 10 and seeing how it copes with a variety of games in my Steam library. If that sounds like something that might interest you, then please hit that subscribe button. And if you've enjoyed this video, please do consider leaving a like. It really helps me with YouTube's algorithm and enables me to bring my content to more people. That said, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.